Hey, well, welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope some of you have had a chance to to uh, see the the field pulpit uh, down at uh, at the Armstrong Browning. If you if you haven't, uh, if, you, if the, this is the first session you've attended today, the the uh, Texas Baptist Historical Commission lent us a the actual field pulpit that, that George Whitfield used for something like 25 years of his career. So uh, after this session, I think the, that the ABL will be uh, open for a little while uh, longer and you can stop by there and see it. It's, it's well worth uh, seeing. Um, this is our last session of the uh, Whitfield at 300 Symposium. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to uh, introduce and, and welcome to campus Bruce Hindmarsh uh, and uh, friend of ours and, and also sender of students to Baylor. So we're, we're especially glad for uh, Bruce's influence here. He's the James M. Houston professor, professor of Spiritual Theology at Regent College in Vancouver. And he's also uh, the past president of the American Society of Church History and the author of the Evangelical Conversion Narrative uh, published by Oxford University Press, as well as John Newton and the English Evangelical Tradition between the conversions of uh, Wesley and Wilberforce, which was published by, by Erdman's. And he was currently working on a book uh, on early evangelical spirituality. And his paper today on Whitfield will form part of that project. So his title, as we see, is A Burning and Shining Light, The Zealous Spirituality of Early George Whitfield. On the 11th of November, 1770, John Newton preached a memorial sermon for George Whitfield for his parish of Olney in the English Midlands. His theme was taken from the words that Christ used to describe John the Baptist. He was a burning and a shining light, John 5:35. Whitfield had been this for Newton, a burning and shining light. In his sermon, Newton emphasized the warmth and the ardency of Whitfield's zeal. No labor could weary him, said Newton. No difficulties discourage him. Hardly any limits could confine him. If there's one thing that it seems to me calls for explanation in Whitfield's spirituality, it is this remarkable ardor of devotion. I've chosen to focus in my lecture this afternoon on the spirituality of the early Whitfield about 1734 to 1744. This is the decade of his life from his encounter with Charles Wesley and the strict discipline of the Oxford Methodists through until the death of his infant son. And it represents Whitfield in his 20s. He would have another two and a half decades of ministry. But these were the years that formed him spiritually and established his spiritual discipline. It was during this important decade that he underwent an evangelical conversion and emerged into public ministry as the boy preacher, that he began preaching outdoors to vast audiences, that he began his grand transatlantic itinerancy and ignited revival through sensational preaching in England, Scotland, and America. He visited Scotland twice and America three times and Wales several more times yet during these years. These were also the years during which he founded and began his fundraising for the orphanage in Georgia that would be one of his chief concerns for the rest of his life. He published 52 individual sermons during this decade, compared with only seven afterward. He published eight volumes of collected sermons, compared with only four afterwards. He published 28 other items, compared with only 16 afterwards. By title, that means more than three quarters of his publications appeared in his 20s. More widely, we can say that this decade was the first decade of evangelicalism in the modern sense, during which key paradigms were established in the evangelical conversion of many leaders, such as John and Charles Wesley and Howell Harris. The emergence of revival paradigms, beginning with the Connecticut River Valley Revival of 1734-35, written about by Jonathan Edwards. The formation during this period of small voluntary groups for devotion and wider transatlantic evangelical networks or connections. And the practice of a new hymnody and new patterns of extempore prayer and preaching 
all of that during Whitfield's 20s. It was also the decade of the first evangelical magazine, such as the Christian History. It was in this decade that the first Great Awakening in its narrow, narrower periodization occurred. The young Whitfield in his 20s was there at the beginning of all of this. Remarkably, and it was these years of his life that would have proved central, one could argue, to the emergence of modern evangelicalism as a form of Christian living that would endure through the next three centuries and spread to five continents. So, the spirituality of the early Whitfield is about so much more than simply the experience of this one young man. The spirituality of the early Whitfield takes us to the roots, to the very heart of modern evangelicalism. I have marked 1744 as the close of this period in Whitfield's life, not only because it gives us a round number, he ends his 20s, uh, but it's in February of that year that his four-month-old son died. Led by inward spiritual impressions, Whitfield had prophesied that this son would be a great preacher. But now he was chastened, taught by the experience to be, he said, more cautious and sober-minded. Although he had already begun to admit some of his earlier mistakes, after the death of his son, he more frequently acknowledged his imprudence. By 1748, he decided to revise his journals. And he wrote about this, as we heard from Stephen earlier. Alas, alas, and how many things I have judged and act wrong, wrongly. I have been too rash and hasty in giving characters both of places and persons. Being fond of scripture language, I have often used a style too apostolical. At the same time, I have been too bitter in my zeal, and so on. And so by this period, he's reflecting back and marking this earlier part of his life as a period, acknowledging his, his uh, regrets. He owned up to indiscretion, bitterness, and spiritual presumptuousness in his 20s. He marks it off as a distinct period. At the same time, it's important to say he in no way dismissed the spiritual significance of these years, during which, as he wrote, still, God filled me with so much of his holy fire and carried me, a poor, weak youth, through such a torrent of popularity and contempt. And he set so many seals to my unworthy ministrations. So notwithstanding his errors, he knew this had been a remarkable period, as indeed it had. How might we characterize the spirituality of Whitfield during these years? There are a number of themes that we can trace in his correspondence that appear also in his journals and his sermons. But there are over 500 letters in the Gillies edition of the collected works that relate to this decade. It's frustrating to read here what I know are selective and edited versions of the lost originals. So I've turned also to examine transcripts of some of the original letters that can be compared with these. Original letters at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth and elsewhere. As a correspondent, Whitfield had a rushed and persistently and sometimes annoyingly ebullient style of letter writing in which he rarely paused for a breath and seemed determined to pump spiritual air into his correspondence as if with bellows. Just as he moved on in his itinerancy from place to place without resting, one gets the sense in many of his letters that he was by no means at leisure to develop a line of thought beyond a few lines or to linger over his correspondent. However, the material is there and it's sufficient for our purposes to outline Whitfield's spirituality as this comes through in his correspondence. It seems to me what we find is a tensile energy in Whitfield's spirituality, tense, compressed like a coiled spring. So I will describe his spirituality by looking at three dialectical tensions. Um, given that tensile energy, how can we unpack that? First, there's a tension between the active and the contemplative life. Second, a tension between self-abasement and self-assertion. And lastly, a tension between maximal spiritual communion and minimal ecclesiastical order. And we'll spend most of our time on the first of these tensions, the active and the contemplative life. Well, we can certainly say that spiritual, <coughs> Whitfield's spirituality it can be characterized as abundantly active. While this was true of his contemporaries, such as uh, Wesley and so on, it was remarkably so in his case. His motto could have been that of Romans 12, verse 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. 
In November 1737, he gave a sample of the sort of activity that would mark his ministry. Last week, save one, he says, I preached ten times in different churches, and the last week, seven, and yesterday, four times, and read prayers twice, though I slept not above an hour the night before, which was spent in religious conversation and in interceding for you, he says to his correspondent. <laughs> he could really put it out. His ideals were evident when he was ill in 1738 and asked for prayer that he would arise from his sickbed and work with ten times more alacrity than he had before. And indeed, he was soon relaying to his correspondence an even more punishing schedule of activity. Uh, years, a few years later, his traveling companion, William Seward, remarked, Our brother generally preaches twice and sometimes three times a day besides riding 10, 15, or 20 miles. He wrote to his friends in Oxford in 1739, writing from Philadelphia with the ardent wish that they would share these ideals. Oh, that you may be filled with a holy fire and such an ardent zeal for God as even to eat you up. He read Fox's Book of Martyrs and thought often about persecution and martyrdom, expecting to be imprisoned on his return to England. As time went on, he was more and more clear that he wished to expend himself utterly in active service and to die preaching as a Holocaust offering to God, an entire offering of himself to God. I intend going on till I drop, he said, or this poor carcass can hold out no more. In the end, he had his wish. So clearly, Whitfield was an active Christian, and this was unmistakably the ethos of his spiritual life. As his friend William Delamott wrote in 1738, God requires that we should be active. In the long history of the church, the active life was thought of in its relationship to the contemplative life, sometimes pictured in the typology of Martha and Mary. And although action and prayer were always to be held together, in the later tradition, the terms have been used to characterize the tendencies of different religious orders in the Catholic Church. So Cistercians, with their calling to a cloistered life of prayer, would be regarded as a contemplative order. In contrast, the mendicant orders and the Jesuits would be regarded as an active order because of their calling to mission and action in the world. Thomas Babington Macaulay figured that if the Methodists had been Catholic, the Pope would have been quick to organize them into a religious order, something like the Jesuits. With all the fears circulating in England in the 1740s about the young pretender, Whitfield and other Methodists were interestingly sometimes accused of being Jesuits in disguise. In uh, Hogarth's famous print, Whitfield has a kind of Jesuitical um, um, a robe uh, that he's wearing and a tonsure, monastic tonsure. Well, we need not take these sorts of associations too seriously. It is clear that Whitfield's evangelical spirituality was a form of devotion that did not withdraw from the world but flowed over into the world with tremendous zeal, just as Ignatian spirituality directed the fervor of devotion, channeled it into missionary work. Well, thinking about this parallel, Ignatian spirituality, evangelical spirituality, we might pause to consider a question that was asked by the Council at Vatican II of all those who were in religious orders. Quote, when your vocation destines you for other tasks in the service of men, pastoral life, missions, teaching, works of charity, and so on, is it not above all the intensity of your union with the Lord that will make them fruitful in proportion to that union in secret? That's the question the Council asked. In the case of Whitfield, my question is whether we can get the taproots of this devotion at his union in secret with the Lord that made him so fruitful in service. Can we get at that? What was the relationship between contemplation and action for him? What kept Whitfield so fired up? If um, I were a sociologist, I might ask, what is it that radicalized Whitfield in his 20s? Well, prior to his evangelical conversion, his experience of Oxford Methodism had already made Whitfield aware of how serious was the Christian calling to a devout and a holy life. This is Oxford Methodism prior to Wesley's uh, 1738 evangelical conversion. Um, so he knew that it was, the Christian life was a serious thing. He was soon writing to his boyhood friend Gabriel Harris to say how dangerous it was to be a lukewarm Christian. 
and to stress the importance of rising early in the morning and devoting oneself to prayer and meditation. Whitfield was formed at Oxford during these years in the Anglican ascetical tradition, the holy living tradition of Jeremy Taylor and William Law that made redeeming the time of utmost importance. Whitfield's short account makes plain how far he took his zeal in the practice of spiritual discipline to the very point of the breaking of his body and spirit altogether. Something of the spirit of that strict period of strict discipline in Oxford Methodism would mark Whitfield all his days, notwithstanding his evangelical conversion. He would forever be redeeming the time. Well, Charles Wesley introduced Whitfield to the pietist August Hermann Franke and to Franke's small but important tract called The Fear of Man. Whitfield often referred to this tract, and it clearly made a serious impression upon him concerning the need to be utterly fearless about standing up to prevailing norms and fashions. Franca wrote that it was a great comfort to him personally that the men of this world speak all manner of evil against me falsely, loading me with censures and accusations. This was a clarion call to the young Whitfield to enter the lists, to take his stand. Franca noted how Christians uh, easily uh, took refuge in the idea that the age of miracles had passed and thereby cut the nerve, he said, of an act of faith. No, he argued, even if one could not do all the mighty works of the biblical heroes, yet ought everyone to follow the faith of these holy men and to exert the same faith with full power and energy. To keep up this boldness required an interior life. We must continue in prayer and childlike communion with God, says Franca. Well, this was to be Whitfield's playbook ever after. It was this that radicalized him. Franca's theme was taken up in a pietist hymn that John Wesley translated into English and published in 1739. Shall I for fear of feeble man the spirit's course in me restrain? Or undismayed in deed and word be a true witness for my Lord? The same year, 1739, that this was published, Francis Oakley and William Delamotte in the same early Methodist circle were imprisoned at Bedford. They were visiting prisoners and then the uh, sheriff, under sheriff, locked them in with the prisoners because they had kind of snuck in. And he locked them in there, imprisoned in Bedford. And from an upper room in the prison, they sang this hymn about the fear of man boldly through the, through the prison grate. They were joined by others in prison and gathering outside. Within a half an hour, there was a crowd of 3,000 people. And so they preached for an hour through the iron grates, where then were released and sang hymns down the streets of Bedford. This theme of rejecting the fear of man is huge. Time and again, Whitfield drew a line in the sand for his hearers and his correspondents, demanding that they make a serious break with their former life if they would be true Christians just as he had done. There is no being a true Christian, he wrote, and yet holding with the world. This meant breaking with old acquaintances and taking a public stand. Come forth, he wrote to a young clergyman in Seer and Sester, and be ye separate, saith the Lord Almighty. Break with the world at once, and you shall become fools for Christ's sake. He even gave this young clergyman a specimen letter, a script, to write to his parents that would show uh, this young man, how to declare himself. Conversion clearly was as much a social phenomenon as a matter of interior states, social dislocation. This seems to be the sort of demand Whitfield placed on those who heard him. A visible, decisive break was needed if faith was to be sufficiently radical and active. There could be no trimming, no dalliance with the world. Plays, dances, card playing, and such frivolous activities would have to be rejected. And you would need to speak up against any signs of worldliness, even if this made you uncomfortable, odious to your former acquaintances. So Whitfield counseled this young clerical correspondent to tell his parents, this was the script, tell them, I will no longer be an almost Christian. Likewise, when in 1738 he provided a transcript of his prayers for John Bray, he tells John Bray, on board ship, he's writing back to John Bray in London saying, this is what I'm praying for you. His theme is again, the fear of man. He said, this is what I'm praying. God bid him not fear men, put him in mind that Christ's servants were always the world's fools and that there is no going to heaven without being laughed at. In the New Testament, the word parousia is used for freedom, boldness and transparency in the Christian life. 
It's the word in ancient Greece for the freedom of the citizen to speak in the assembly in their own proper person. And the Apostle Paul argued that the Spirit of God had given believers such parousia. Seeing then that we have such hope, the Apostle Paul writes, we use great plainness of speech, we use great boldness, we use great parousia. This, I think, was one of the marks of Whitfield's spirituality from very early. He was provoked to it by reading Franca when he was barely 20 years old. His decision to be done with the fear of man was a critical break with the enormous social pressure in traditional ancien regime society to conform to expectations, to be prudent, to respect propriety. Perhaps especially with the folk memories of the Civil War and the social chaos of the interregnum, Augustan society would exert steady, persistent pressure to simply obey your betters and maintain propriety. You can see this in some of the anti-Methodist literature in the, um, uh, in the newspapers, uh, in the resistance to Whitfield. All this concern for propriety, Whitfield tossed aside with youthful abandon after reading Franca. In addition, though, though, to these influences from first the Anglican holy living tradition and then from pietism, Whitfield was radicalized by his own, his own direct and immediate experience of God. Charles Wesley gave him another important book. Never underestimate the importance of little books. Henry Scougal's Life of God and the Soul of Man. Reading it was a turning point and Whitfield marked it as especially significant in his short account, his uh, early autobiography. Indeed, he claimed, I never knew what true religion was till God sent me that excellent treatise. And when he read Scougal's words, true religion was a union of the soul with God and Christ formed within us, Whitfield said, a ray of divine light was instantaneously darted in upon my soul. And from that moment, but not till then, did I know I must be a new creature. Whitfield was here pointing to something qualitatively new in his experience. And Scougal's teaching would find its fruit in Whitfield's evangelical conversion and his preaching thereafter on the new birth. It was the difference, as he said to William Seward, between working for life and working from life. Scougal was a part of a circle of Scottish Episcopalians that gathered around Robert Layton and who were devotees of the continental mystics in general and Madame Guillon in particular. They have been described as the mystics of the Northeast. Scougal was influenced by Thomas Akempis, Teresa of Avila, Gaston de Renty, as well as the Cambridge Platonist Henry Moore and others. His spiritual doctrine press the reader to experience for himself really and truly the un experience of union with God. His metaphors were those of the mystics. The divine life in the human soul was, he said, a real participation of God's nature. It is a beam of the eternal light, a drop of that infinite ocean of goodness. With Scougal then, we find a conduit to bring certain strains of continental Catholic spirituality to the English evangelicals. Reg Ward has argued that mysticism formed a part of the background of the evangelical tradition in Germany, and also that there were key conduit figures such as Johann Arndt and Gerhard Terstegen and others who transmitted this spirituality forward to later generations. Well, Skugel was, I think, one of these conduits for English speakers. Interesting, the late 17th century has been called the twilight of the mystics. Bernard McGinn's last volume on uh, the history of mysticism is going to deal with this. As the over-sophistication of Carmelite spirituality and the church's reaction to quietism killed mysticism in the Catholic Church. I wonder though if we might argue for a kind of democratization of mysticism as Skugel transmitted to evangelicals such as Whitfield the potent ideal of direct, unmediated relationship of the individual believer with God separable in principle from the mediation of the church. Direct, unmediated relationship of the individual believer with God, separate in principle from the mediation of the church. This mystical teaching is of course shorn of any anagogical Platonic doctrine of ascent. It is simplified and naturalized within a Protestant framework, but it's no less powerful for that, holding out the promise of the very life of God in the soul of man. Scougal introduced Whitfield to the possibility of something of a directly sensible and present experience of God. And this would be the most important spiritual source, I think, for his active devotion. <laughs>
far more important even than the strictness of Oxford Methodism or the fearlessness of Franca. This was the union in secret that made him fruitful in service, to use the terms of Vatican II again. This was how the contemplative life and the active life were to be held together in his experience. During this decade, Whitfield placed tremendous stress upon the immediate and the felt, the immediate and the felt experience of God, the life of God and the soul of man. Was Whitfield therefore a charismatic? This may be the wrong question. As a friend of mine says, if he wasn't Pentecostal, maybe he was sort of costal. <laughs> This may be the wrong question, but it should be emphasized how significant was the role of the Holy Spirit in Whitfield's day-to-day -day life and ministry during these years. He may not have advocated the exercise of miracles or charismata, such as glossolalia, uh, but as Tommy has suggested in his work on the Great Awakening and in this recent biography, Whitfield made the experience of the Spirit utterly central to the lived reality of the Christian life. The Pentecostal historian David Jewell has argued that a shift of emphasis in Whitfield's ministry can be noticed following his ordination in January 1739, since he recorded later in his journal, now I know that I did receive the Holy Ghost at the imposition of hands. And certainly, okay, Whitfield certainly took seriously the language of the Anglican ordinal of being inwardly moved by the Holy Ghost to take this office upon you and so on. And I think Jewell is correct to highlight the Pentecostal importance of ordination for Whitfield, but he points to the priesting of Whitfield in 1739, and it's important to emphasize in Anglican ordination that this is the second stage of his ordination, and the more basic ordination is to deacon's orders in April 1736. In an important letter in April 1739, William Seward wrote from Gloucester that in contrast to some of the clergy thereabouts, Brother Whitfield has had joy in the Holy Ghost without intermission for three years. If we do the math, this takes us back not to his priesting, nor to his conversion at Pembroke College, but to his entering into deacon's orders. It's interesting to note also that this event is the climax and the conclusion of his short account of God's dealings with George Whitfield from his infancy to what? To his ordination. So in literary terms, it's also the climax of that account. In any case, thereafter, the direct experience of the Spirit was a theme that we find throughout Whitfield's letters. He wrote to the Earl of Leven and Melville in Scotland and encouraged him, be still and you will hear the secret whispers of the Holy Ghost. One of his concerns about controversy in another letter was the way in which it embitters the Spirit, ruffles the soul, and hinders it from hearing the small, still voice of the Holy Ghost. To Thomas Noble of New York, he wrote, there needs a close adherence to the motions of the Holy Spirit. Famously, Whitfield wrote to Bishop Butler of Bristol in 1739 that the Holy Spirit may be perceived by the soul as really as any sensible impression made upon the body, as easily felt by the soul as the wind may be felt by the body. My Lord, indeed, we speak what we know. The spirituality of the early Whitfield was pretty Pentecostal. In 1742, Whitfield returned to Scotland to heighten expectations, and he wrote back to London that as soon as I came on shore, the Holy Spirit filled my soul. He reported, his reported experience was not mediated or discursively reasoned or hedged about with concessive clauses. There was no parenthetical, so it seemed to me. It was utterly direct. His sense of the presence of God was immediate during these years, and he often interrupted his letters with exclamations of wonder to this effect. The signal was often that interjection, oh, that the actor David Garrick so admired. Oh, dear Sir Whitfield wrote to one correspondent in 1739, my heart is now melted with a sense of divine love. To another he writes from on board ship and breaks out, oh, the love of Christ, I feel it, I feel it. God now sheds it abroad in my heart. He thus witnessed time and again to the now of God's presence. My soul is now in a heavenly frame. My dear brother, the love of God now fills my soul. Dear sir, my heart is now enlarged with the sense of the freeness and the fullness of the Redeemer's loving kindness. While I am musing, he writes to another, the fire kindles. Such feelings made him able to write without reserve. The love of Jesus fills my soul, he wrote to David Erskine at Sterling. 
and constrains me thus to write freely to you. There was an outward freedom from reserve that answered to his interior freedom. So he says, I forget myself when writing of Jesus. Not only did he take a kind of cross-section of his spiritual emotions while writing, but he also frequently shared with several of his correspondents more generally his ongoing consciousness. Like William Seward said, you know, three years uninterrupted joy in the Holy Spirit, the ongoing consciousness of this immediate felt presence of God. To Jonathan Belcher, the governor of Massachusetts, he writes, I experience daily much of his divine presence. The adverb daily comes up again when he writes, God brings me nearer and nearer to himself daily. Or again, my happiness in Jesus increases daily. Day by day, he said, God refreshed his soul, and day by day he was quickened and comforted. The other word he used was continued and continually. On board ship in 1741, he testified, I have had God's continued presence during the passage. He wrote to Howell Harris from Edinburgh in 1741, I walk in the continual sunshine of his countenance, and a few days later, I walk continually in the comforts of the Holy Ghost. Clearly, this was a unique period in which he seemed to walk in a cloud of spiritual wonders from day to day. Scugo's life of God and the soul of man seems to have been his animating principle. Sometimes he used the language of being filled with God. His presence is filling my soul, he says, and renewing my bodily strength. Or, I think I know what it is to wait upon the Lord in silence and to feel the Spirit of God. Often I have been at such times filled, as it were, with the fullness of God. He pinpointed one of these experiences, gave it a date stamp, saying, last night, the great God in a glorious manner filled and overshadowed my soul. To John Wesley in 1740, he reported, the Lord fills me both body and soul. He struggled for language. He is much with my soul and fills me abundantly, I could almost say super abundantly with his presence. Sometimes he interrupted his letters again with exclamations to this effect. On board ship preparing to leave for Georgia uh, in the downs off the Kentish coast, he wrote to John Edmund and halfway through the letter he burst out, I am full, I am full. <laughs> he urged others to experience this for themselves as well, urging John Meriton, for example, plead his promises, be much in secret prayer and never give God rest till your soul is filled with all his fullness. A lot of this is the echoing um, the language of Colossians. To John Bray, he says, to sum up everything, I wish you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This was for everybody, democratized. Indeed, the direct immediate experience of God was something transmitted to those who heard him preach in the fields. Mary Ramsey was a school teacher who followed Whitfield in London and heard him preach prior to his first voyage to Georgia in um, 1737. And she listened intently to everything he said. She says, I would go home in a great hurry with a great deal of the sermons in my head so that I could repeat half or sometimes three quarters of the discourse. She argued vigorously with anyone in the crowd who criticized the young preacher and she said, I heard him 13 times. Did Whitfield's spirituality influence those who heard him in the fields like this? I think it did. Martha Jones was another who pre heard him preach in the open fields. She says, at last I heard Mr. Whitfield a little before he went to Georgia. I heard him preach four times, but the account I had of his life had much more effect on me than his sermons. The piety, the piety, the piety of the young preacher, his spirituality, made a deep impression. And I had a glimpse how far I was from being a Christian. I now grew very uneasy. Clearly, Whitfield's dynamic spirituality had left a mark. We can see this also in the response to his preaching in the open fields at Cambus Lang in Scotland, too where the minister, William McCulloch, took down the testimonies of the converts. Anne Wiley was a 32-year-old single woman who heard Whitfield and could echo his language of the fullness, of fullness and uh, of filling. That lecture, 
And you see there it says, uh, of 12, that was William McCulloch's shorthand. He gave numbers for the ministers, and so 12 was Whitfield. That lecture of 12, that lecture of Whitfield, um, sorry, I find my notes here. Uh, that Whitfield, the lecture of Whitfield on Elisha's multiplying the widow's oil, which I had been reading some time before, and that concerning the Lord's looking upon Peter, two sermons, came fresh into my mind so that I could almost repeat the whole of these two discourses. And that I repeated uh, the first of these, applying it to myself and saying that I was the empty soul the Lord was filling and pouring the oil of grace into. So the language of filling here again. The, um, the marginalia here, by the way, is uh, this uh, W to R is William Webster, and this is uh, Thomas Gillespie. And they, these were clerical marginators, other Presbyterians who marked the text for the bits that they thought should be deleted if this ever got published. <laughs> so. um. Later on, uh, Anne Wiley echoes the language of uh, melting that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, in the evening, hearing Whitfield, um, again, number 12. Um, sorry, I gotta go back. Oh, it's not coming through, that's all right. Um, We'll carry on, I'll give, you, give it here. Um, hearing Whitfield on that text, thy maker is thy husband, etc. And while well, he said, I'll tell you one thing that hinders your marriage with Christ, and that is your unbelief. This came home with power, a common refrain of those who heard Whitfield in Scotland. This came home with power and melted me down. And I was made to see that this was just the thing that had kept me from Christ. And this sweet melting frame continued with me all the rest of the sermon. The sense that the hearers was looking, were looking for a direct and sensible experience of God is reflected in the words of the 20-year-old young man uh, who showed up but was disappointed. One time I heard Whitfield preach there, but I got nothing. <laughs> it's like, nah, I got nothing. <laughs> this was in contrast to his peer, William Montgomery, who did get something. He says, it's hard to see there, and uh, sorry, this isn't working, but he just said, I got much love to Christ. And he said, I was so faintish I could not stand. Down he went uh, to the ground. It will be possible to go on at length to illustrate this very direct, sensible, and immediate experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit in Whitfield's life that he recounted and that he transmitted uh, to others. But this should be enough, I think, to see that the inner flame that burned passed over into the heat of evangelical activism. It was here that Whitfield's spirituality held together a dialectic between outward zeal and interior warmth, an active life and a contemplative life. That's the first dialectic. The other two we'll look at more briefly. Um, Self-abasement and self-exertion is the second. We may further characterize Whitfield's spirituality during these years as self-abasing in the midst of self-exertion. Given his asserting of his own agency in relentless activity, it is perhaps surprising to find the language of his interior devotion so often acted to erase his own agency altogether. He spoke time and again of his own soul melting, I've alluded to this, or his congregations melting under his preaching. Very early in his ministry, he wrote probably to James Hutton saying, Sometimes God touches me from above and my heart, hard as it, as it is, is melted down, quite overcome with the sense of, his free, of the free grace of God in Christ Jesus towards me. He confided to William Seward that sometimes he was so melted by a sense of the free, sovereign, and everlasting love of God that he thought he was going to die. This melting is often associated with tears. His divine love now melts down my heart and draws tears from my eyes. He made this a general desideratum for others, writing to one female correspondent saying that the first step to being a Christian was a heart melted down with a sense of sin and flying to Jesus Christ. 
That's what it meant to come to Christ for Whitfield. This was therefore how he typically reported the behavior of particularly responsive audiences when he preached. At New York, some 12,000 were melting and crying in 1740. At Bristol in 1741, there was a sweet melting at every sermon. And at Edinburgh in 1742, the same. More melting. Everybody is melting everywhere. This ideal of melting like candle wax in the presence of God was parallel to his expressed desire so often to dissolve and to be with Christ, something he wrote about especially when he was seriously ill. When suffering a violent fever on board the Whitaker in 1738, he wrote, I earnestly desired to be dissolved and to go to Christ. I am weak and faint, he wrote again when ill in 1747, and I long to be dissolved and to be with Jesus. But even rapturous spiritual delights could evoke this sentiment. God gives me such a foretaste of his love that I am almost continually wishing to be dissolved, that I might be with Christ. Whitfield's spiritual desires were thus often expressed in quietest terms, the terms of the dissolution of the self, where he idealizes a loss of identity and imagines himself melting or dissolving away into nothing. A different metaphor with the same sensibility appears when he writes to Jonathan Bryan, I love to see a soul lie in the dust under a sense of electing love. At other times he used the Moravian language of being a poor sinner sitting at the feet of Jesus. Again, he simply cried out to one correspondent, oh, that I could be lower. I desire, he said, to lie in the dust and kiss the Redeemer's feet. Sometimes the language of abasement and self-diminution was that of being swallowed up in God, as he wrote to one correspondent. The love of Jesus now swallows up my soul. He begins another letter, my soul is now in a heavenly frame, swallowed up in God. At other times the language is of vertigo or sinking. I am lost. I want to sink into nothing whenever I think of Christ's dying for me. Melting, dissolving, lying in the dust, being swallowed up, lost, sinking. Clearly, Whitfield is expressing an intensity of self-abasing, self-abnegating, self-forgetting contemplation of God in God's sovereign love and glory. It was the response of the prophets to the vision of God, woe is me, for I am undone. This was the Calvinist Whitfield at his prayers. As he said, God in love empties before he fills, humbles before he exalts. Earlier this year, I presented and published some research where I sought to place this sort of Calvinist devotional sensibility of self-abasement before holy God, to place this in the context of the extensive 18th century discussion of the sublime in moral and aesthetic philosophy and in painting and music. There's an important passage, for example, in Edmund Burke, where he speaks of the capacity for power to produce the sublime. His supreme example is the contemplation of the Godhead itself. He seems to picture God with an arm upraised as in Michelangelo's Last Judgment. This is Burke. Whilst we contemplate so vast an object under the arm, as it were, of almighty power and invest it upon every side with omnipresence, we shrink into the minuteness of our own nature and are in a manner annihilated before him. And though a consideration of his other attributes may relieve in some measure our apprehensions, yet no conviction of the justice with which it is exercised, nor the mercy with which it is tempered, can wholly remove the terror which naturally arises from a force which nothing can withstand. If we rejoice, we rejoice with trembling. Several phrases here could have been used by Whitfield and other Calvinists. The key phrase is we shrink into the minuteness of our own nature and are in a manner annihilated before him. Although Burke is not talking about Calvinism and he does not emphasize sovereign love, it does seem to me that the response of tender souls to sovereign grace is often in the language of Burke's sublime. What we see of self-abasement in Whitfield could be reproduced in other Calvinists such as Anne Dutton. In Whitfield, however, this self-abasement in response to sovereign grace was matched in the dialectic by a corresponding self-exertion by the power of sovereign grace. The tender feelings of interiority, melting, dissolving, shedding tears, seem to emphasize a receptive or a yielding, surrendering quality to Whitfield's spirituality. And yet we found in, count in counterpoise to this all the martial imagery of battle. It's there on like 
every other letter. It's in no way passive at all. In his short account, there was plenty of psychomachia too, supernatural contests for, uh, in the spiritual realms, contests for the soul. This language of spiritual warfare often returned as he described his spiritual experience on board ship. I long to call the lingering battle on. Satan hath been busy with me since I saw you, especially since my retirement on shipboard, he wrote in 1739. As soon as he began to preach on shore, the image of battle comes back again in full force. In Philadelphia, it was Israel and the Philistines in combat. The devil and all his hosts will set their battle in array against us. My Lord has given me a sling and a stone. Stripling as I am, I will go forth in his strength, make mention of his righteousness only, and by that lay prostrate the strong Goliath. In Georgia, he was waiting for fresh attacks from the enemy. And in New York, the war between Michael and the dragon had much increased. The language is that of war. His preaching in the marketplace was often described, likewise, in the language of battle. William Seward wrote of what a scene it was to see our brother storm the enemy in his strong fortress of balls, assemblies, and playhouses, and to give him battle. The famous accounts of his preaching in Moorfields in 1742, when he had um, stones, dirt, rotten eggs, and even pieces of dead cats thrown at him, was replete with the language of spiritual warfare. The scene is the one that you see here painted by the artist Air Crow in 1865. Uh, for the Royal Academy exhibition in that year. Um, Whitfield's competitors, some of them pictured here, drummers, trumpeters, Mary Andrews, masters of puppet shows, exhibitors of wild beasts, stage players and all. These were, he said, the agents of Satan. It's a tumultuous scene of battle. The crowd, um, you know, uh, there, there'd be a recruiting sergeant, there'd be a trumpet, the crowd would uh, sway back and forth. They'd stop to sing a hymn and he'd begin preaching again. There was even a streaker who ran through the scene. <laughs> but Air Crow chose not to picture that part of that, <laughs> what Whitfield wrote about. Not only was preaching like war, so also his very travels were those of a general. I must fight my way through till I come to London, he wrote to Samuel Mason. Later on in 1742, even when he was more or less at home, he was still in my winter quarters preparing for a fresh campaign. Whitfield might be self-abasing in the presence of divine love, but he was ready to do battle royal when energized by that same love to reach lost sinners. This boldness reprised Whitfield's earlier commitment to be done with the fear of man. Thus, William Seward wrote of their joint efforts, man opposes, the devil rages, but God is with us and we will not fear man. In fact, the tables could be turned in this regard, says Whitfield about the same time, there were many scoffers, but God caused them to feel and fear me. In many ways, the image that unites self-abasement and self-assertion assertion is the image of fire. It is the fire of divine love that Whitfield, before which Whitfield melts inwardly, and it is filled with this fire that he goes forth, conquering and to conquer. It was the burning of the Holy Spirit that caused melting when he wrote to the Howell Harris, call down fire from heaven, even the fire of the Holy Ghost, to soften, sweeten, and refine, and melt them into love. To Samuel Mason he wrote in parallel lines that his heart, hard as it is, is melted down, and also that he wanted the heart of a seraphim that he might burn with love like theirs. And what is the result for his ministry? He continues to Mason saying of his preaching on the Kentish coast, I came to send fire into Deal, and it is already kindled. It is all in a holy flame. A few months later, he tells Mason, I want to be a flaming fire. Phyllis Mack has explored the tension that I'm identifying here between agency and passivity more generally in Methodism. And she argues that it was this that gave the movement its torque. Remember I talked about that tensile quality? It was this that finally, she says, enabled these introspective people to become activists and to develop a modern but still religious sense of self. This pointed forward to, says Phyllis, their struggle to fuse self-transcendence and agency enabled these introspective religious people to become activists, mobilizing the energy that allowed the abolitionists and missionaries of the 19th century 
to feel both commanded and creative. Or as Whitfield put it, being emptied of self, I threw myself into the hands of God. Finally, in addition to the dialectic of active and contemplative, self-abasing and self-asserting, there is in Whitfield's spirituality a real tension between maximal spiritual fellowship with individuals and minimal ecclesiastical order. As early as January 1738, he was already writing to a correspondent in these terms saying, I would willingly have that Catholic spirit as to love the image of my divine master wherever I see it, though I should think it a sin in me to dissent from the established church. There's the tension. For all his doctrine, all the ways his doctrine look back in many ways to the past, to the Puritans and so on, there was something presciently modern about the relationship of self and society in Whitfield's spirituality. As the Ancien Regime is superseded by the modern world with its constitutional guarantees of freedom of religion, its democratic ideals and commercial freedoms, its industry, its technology, its enlarged print and other public media, and its efficient and long distance communication and trade, all these things, there are new forms of subjectivity to go along with this. What Habermas has called an audience-oriented subjectivity. This is something anyone who has a profile on Facebook should understand, audience-oriented subjectivity. Even if the relevant media in the 18th century is the periodical press. In this modernizing world, Whitfield would increasingly appeal to women and men as personal agents and connect them in intimate small groups and larger associations that were voluntary rather than mandated by corporate hierarchies or social custom. And just as important, it seems to me that Whitfield, in his own person, uniquely experienced, let's call it an advanced pluralism in his times by virtue of his transatlantic itinerancy. He was the quintessentially modern, mobile, compact self, untethered from the socially reinforcing structures of a tightly nucleated pre-modern community. What other religious or political figure moved like he did, slipping in and out of differently ordered religious communities, but genuinely engaging those communities. He was in these years a catalyst for evangelical revival among Anglicans in England, Presbyterians in Scotland, Congregationalists in New England, and so on. It's almost like the Queen becoming Presbyterian when she goes into Scotland, you know? He joins these different communities. In his own person as the grand itinerant, he experienced the diversity of North Atlantic Protestantism like no one else. And his letters give a vivid sense of how this caused him to minimize church order and to maximize spiritual solidarity with individuals who had been born again, people who manifest that they love Jesus. He had to subordinate church order to this evangelical piety, especially when the halcyon days of initial awakening were followed by ecclesiastical divisions in every place he went. Conceived widely, church order refers, the way I'm using it, refers to any visible form of, of organization of the church. But the issues particularly at play in the 18th century include church-state constitutionality, the ordering of the church and the governance of the church, and the administration and mode of the sacraments. About none of these things did Whitfield have much to say. These were things he minimized. So in 1739, the Anglican Whitfield wrote from the much admired religious liberty of Philadelphia, where he had been at a Quaker meeting, he writes to the independent Congregationalist Philip Doddridge at his dissenting academy in Northampton, England. Think about the different places and religious uh, communities. Doddridge and Whitfield would certainly have differed over these issues of church, visible church order, yet Whitfield wrote this. Though you are not of the Church of England, yet if you are persuaded in your own minds of the truth of the way wherein you now walk, I leave it. Whether conformists or nonconformists, our main concern should be to be assured that we are called and taught of God, for none but such are fit to minister in holy things. Thus, neither Anglican nor Congregationalist church order were of any interest to Whitfield. These were things about which they could disagree as a matter of conscience and under the constitutional provisions of the state for toleration. What he wanted to maximize was their holy spiritual communion in a kind of convocation of the spirit, aware that we are each called and taught of God individually. 
We can see this simultaneous maximizing and minimizing again as he writes to a Presbyterian minister later the same month saying, what a divine sympathy and attraction there is between all those who by one spirit are made members of that mystical body whereof Jesus Christ is the head. Blessed be God that his love is so far shed abroad in our hearts as to cause us to love one another, though we differ a little as to externals. For my part, I hate to mention them. My sole question is, are you a Christian? If so, you are my brother, my sister, my mother. Yet a little while we shall sit down together in the kingdom of our Father. That one little quotation actually packs most of it in of what I'm trying to get at here. The crucial 17th century question of what constitutes a true church is brushed aside. It's exchanged for the question, what constitutes a true Christian? And as always, when he's stuck on the horns of, horns of a denominational division, he appeals to eschatology, he appeals to heaven. In a little while, we, just, we will sit down in the kingdom of the Father, and it'll all be okay. He eschews visible forms as unmentionable externals. I hate to mention them. Yet he clearly believes in a secret work of the Holy Spirit that constitutes women and men as members of Christ's mystical body. It's the Spirit that did this work of regeneration. And he felt that this, this is important, he felt that this secret work of the Spirit was discernible still. Somehow it was visible, was discernible. Believers would recognize in each other a certain divine sympathy and attraction. A mystical bond as God's own love made them to love one another. All this is happening without a church. Effectively, Whitfield took Edward's doctrine of religious affections and made this a kind of ecclesiological principle. There's a church operating here, my brother, my sister, and mother, he says, but it is not constituted by stated ecclesiastical authority or there's not any organization, but just elective spiritual affinity. The word sentimental is not pejorative in this period, like we would use it pejoratively as something merely sentimental. And so in this stronger sense of the word sentimental, I would say Whitfield believed in a sentimental ecumenism. In some ways, this is not unlike the view of some mid-century, uh, 17th century dissenters that the church was a narrative community of the manifestly regenerate. Except that for Whitfield, this narrative community was not local, gathered, but dispersed among many denominations in many places. I think it is quite a remarkable development and uh, perhaps it doesn't seem novel to us because it's the way in which we tend to operate uh, when there is transdenominational Christian fellowship today. It's written in letters too large for us to read anymore. Oddly enough though, Whitfield wrote all of this at the very same time that the free grace controversy with Wesley was on the boil. The very same day that he was writing this stuff and finding common ground with Doddridge, November the 10th, 1739. He was firming up his own convictions about the doctrine of election and the perseverance of the saints and telling Howell Harris that he was more enlightened than ever about this and it would be more explicit than ever. I'm gonna be more exacting about doctrine. Wesley was going down. Somehow he could separate soteriology and where every pin in the tabernacle is precious and ecclesiology, he could separate these almost completely or at least repurpose his spirituality to do some quasi para ecclesial work even as it would turn out with Wesley, with whom, uh, whom he would never unchurch and whose spirituality was never in question, even when they went at it hammer and tongs over uh, soteriology. People had different ways of trying to work out how we are in fellowship while we disagree about these things. John Newton wrote to a favorite example of this, wrote to John Wesley and said, though you may not believe in the doctrine of election, I can still believe that you're elect. Examples of this maximizing of spiritual communion and minimizing of denominational distinctives could be multiplied since it was Whitfield's modus operandi uh, going forward. It seems that spirituality came first. Um, spirituality came first. It's on this basis he would negotiate the tensions as they came up with the associate presbytery, the seceders in Scotland, though he could, they could not grant him the same judgment of charity. Whitfield found himself having to find room to maneuver, even with John Willison of Dundee in 1742, an evangelical minister of the Church of Scotland. Whitfield had been willing to take communion with uh, these Presbyterians, even to baptize children in their Presbyterian way, yet Whitfield still felt like Willison would not really be happy until he renounced the Church of England 
So here's this tension, ecclesiastical order and spiritual fellowship. How does he negotiate it? Whitfield pressed forward and urged a Catholic spirit, and this is how he explained it. Though I am a strenuous defender of the righteousness of Christ and utterly detest Arminian principles, I will stand firm on these soteriological things. He says, um, yet I know God gave me the Holy Ghost before I was clear in either of these points as to head knowledge. So before I had my Calvinism worked out, I had the Holy Spirit. Spirituality came first. He experienced regeneration first. He entered into the life of the Holy Spirit first before he got entirely clear about his Reformed theology. Spirituality would therefore be a sufficient principle for him for pan-evangelical solidarity. Well, when Whitfield's birthday came around again in December 1744, he would bid goodbye to his 20s. And he'd be a wiser and more chastened man, as we've seen in that earlier quotation after his son died. And in many ways, I like the Whitfield of the later years a little bit better than the young Whitfield. But for better or worse, these dialectical tensions in his early spirituality between action and contemplation, between self-surrender and self-exertion, between maximal fellowship and minimal church order. These would mark the evangelical movement, not just in his life, but for years to come. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've, we've had a very rich day, and uh, we do have time for a few questions. I'm sure there will be some after this very stimulating presentation. So who will go first? Dr. Turpin. The ways in which Whitfield spoke about the self abnegation and self assertion, they struck me as very stereotypically female and male, respectively, at the time. Does he ever use that metaphor explicitly, or does it remain under the surface? Um, yes, he does. The sermon that carried the freight at uh, Campus Lang in Scotland that did an awful lot of work is Thy Maker is Thy Husband, right? And, and so it, it genders the hearer in terms of. Uh, uh, um, female response, you know, as in like um, Carolyn Walker Bynum on the Middle Ages, right? And, um, and so, um, but he doesn't typically, he doesn't, doesn't over-realize that kind of um, um, identifying it as a female kind of uh, characteristic. Some current writers analyzing anti-Methodist literature, much of which sexualizes Methodism and so on, make those connections um, in, in other ways. Dr. Steuben round. First, uh, wonderful uh, And you mentioned both the themes of, and actually we're talking a little about this during the break, the sublime, but you also brought up sentimentalism. Uh, this moment that you're, that you're focused on here is a little bit early for the cult of sensibility, emotional sensibility, but yet it seems to be moving in that direction. Does Christian fellowship merely for Whitfield sort of flow out of this principle? All about which the self? Pardon? All about what? Which is about sort of wallowing in the self right. Uh, right. and developing the self through relationships with others. Uh, is there any that in the what, what does Christian fellowship do? Is it merely a result? Or is it, does it constitute some important factor of what is this spiritual development? Um, right, so this is early in terms of that kind of periodization. And uh, later, Wesley will use language uh, like the man of feeling. He'll be aware of that kind of language. Um, yeah, I think, um, I, think, I think Whitfield would feel like it is the, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that creates that solidarity, you know? And it would be, it would be the, um, the affections that Jonathan Edward writes about that are constituted, first of all, in a certain kind of uh, view of divine things in themselves that then produces this and what follows from it is solidarity. It's interesting how often people express the kind of sentimental solidarity with Whitfield after they read his journals. And it's like his experience is like my experience. So Howell Harris read the journals and like knew that they had, um, had a kind of spiritual uh, solidarity. And so often it's like they share their experience and then find a kind of narrative solidarity. So, um, 
Whitfield's language would certainly be that what comes first is being born from above. There's a spiritual dynamic that then is recognized, discerned in the other, and uh, a kind of genuine spiritual fellowship that is the horizontal connections that are, they're real, they're discerned, they're ontologically there. But it's, um, it's, that's why I think that language, I call it a kind of convocation of the Holy Spirit, that he, his ecclesiology that he says to Philip Doddridge, all those who are called of God, you know, that they recognize in a kind of triangulation that we're connected. What's interesting is just that he felt without any ecclesiastical order, without a church, that this could be discerned. It's sort of like I just look at you and I know you love Jesus, right? That's enough for me. A bit more than that, but yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question about your section on um, Acton Whitfield. Uh, as you were discussing, you know, I was struck by the parallels between his life and the Apostle Paul. I'm curious, did Whitfield ever compare himself to Paul in terms of his life experiences? Um, yeah, I think he did. Yeah, I um, um, wrote a sermon on Saul's conversion in which the, the tableau of Saul's conversion is kind of played into the present. And um, in that, the way that works out, I suppose he's not, he's not the Apostle Paul, but uh, certainly I think the way he identified, I can't think off the hand of text and so on, maybe Tommy can, but in the same way that he identified, over-identified with Jesus, I think he certainly identified with Paul. So I don't remember... Yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's any, I mean, it, it jumps out at you so much when, about the way that he identifies with Jesus in, in his autobiography uh, that, that he deletes in later, <laughs> later editions. But I, I don't remember any specific comparison uh, to, to, to Paul, although um, I, I, I do know that he, uh, one of his, uh, in, one of the times that he would act out uh, uh, stories and in, in, in sermons is Saul's conversion um, and, and you know he, so there were times when he would actually act out that, that story in his, his sermon but I don't I don't remember about him personally applying to himself he would know <laughs> maybe not he said a lot of things yeah, yeah. yes I have one um, this was one also I was struck by in Tommy's talk last night but I couldn't help but notice that many of the references when you were talking about the, the letters that people commenting on the sermons, they were often women. And the, the emotional experiences you mentioned, I think it was Lath and Clark last mm -hmm. night, Tommy, and then you mentioned, I think it was, um, um, well, I can't remember the names of the ones that you mentioned this morning, but the one the woman who went 13 times to the sermon. And then, of course, the one example that you used of the person who didn't get anything out of it was a 21-year-old man who said, I got nothing. Um, so I'm curious, is there, a, is there any sense that he's especially appealing to women? Is there anything that we get? Is there any sort of connection? Or is this just, do we just have more women's, more women writing? Is this just something that women tend to keep more diaries and letters where they're writing down about their certain experiences and it creates an idea that I mean, what's going on here? Or is, or is it just that these were really good examples that you use and it has nothing to do with more women being attracted to his sermons. It's more the latter. These are the examples that I, okay. that I chose to use because okay. we could have uh, Joseph Clark, Thomas Cooper, their apprentices and other figures. Um, there's a lot of material to look from. I'm sure it is patient of analysis in those kinds of ways and one would find some, some distinctions about how people respond. James Hutton said of the Wesley brothers that the that the women who followed them were mostly in love with the Wesley brothers, you know. And so those, those accusations were even being made sort of within Methodist circles, not just from the anti-Methodists. And so they were already noticing dynamics and so on. And, um, but, I, uh, uh, but these were just the examples that I thought would illustrate stuff. There's about 160 letters in the one collection and about that many in the other collection. So there's no gender pattern? Uh, not, that, not that I've noticed particularly. The one thing I did notice is, this is not to do with Whitfield, but the women often particularly identified with women's texts. Daughter, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven thee. The woman with the issue of blood, like the, like the Virgin Mary, and they use that kind of language. And the preachers, uh, Whitfield, John Senek in a sermon on the woman with the issue of blood, they were, they were quick to pick up and apply that sort of language. Even though they didn't apply it just to women, when the women heard that, they responded that way. Thank you for that. Yeah. Do men do the same thing? Um, 
I think they probably would universalize most of the languages as male when they hear it. I don't know that they particularly pick up on male texts, right? I don't think so. I'd have to think about that. Yeah. David? Do you know the occasion for that crow's picture in 1861? No, I would love to know more about it. It did strike me that it's the same year of the publication of the novel that I mentioned, ah. The Diary of Mrs. Kissinger. Yeah. I think that's why it is the accident. Yeah. I don't know what month the novel was published. You wonder what was in the air in, seven, in 1865. Yes, it's not an obvious centenary. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, Don. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, person, the person who some of this reminds me of is Rousseau, the kind of the intense interior life, but not always the easiest person to get on with. Um, are there any examples of the diffusion of the Whitfield idiom into the so called secular culture that you would um, credit? Um, the kind of social conditions that I just kind of whipped through sort of prior to the kind of Habermasian quotation about um, you know, long distance trade, uh, print media, um, um, changes in transportation, uh, constitutional guarantees, like these are, this is something that everybody is experiencing. So in the sense, in terms of the conditions on the ground that constitute new kind of relationship of self and society, I think it's the kind of thing that uh, people are finding their way in a new way Identity is less given than it's, it's beginning to be more constructed, more a sense of, of agency, and so on. I think it's one of the things that when people hear Whitfield, they, um, so whether there's others that, that use Whitfield's language or, or goes that way, I think people are kind of uniquely prepared to hear him and they say, never in all my days at church had I ever, had I ever heard anything like this. They, in a sense, they're called out into narrative and they're kind of ready for it. But in terms of, um, that kind of um, sensibility um, from Whitfield sort of influencing wider, you know, one can make sort of general parallels. I'm not sure how, I would, how you would trace it out sort of beyond evangelical circles or what other parallels you would find. But I think it's, it's one of those things where you see lots of arrows pointing in the same direction in terms of self and society, agency, um, what Phyllis Mack traces uh, more widely among the Methodists. Um, I think it's definitely there um, in the culture. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, that will wrap things up for our uh, symposium. And I, I just want to say uh, I'm thankful again to uh, Byron Johnson at the Institute for Studies of Religion for, for hosting us uh, to, to do this. I'm uh, thankful to you all for, for coming and joining us. And, and thank you to our out of town guests, uh, Stephen, Peter, Pippa. And Bruce, I'm glad to have you all come and visit us to, to help us think about uh, George Whitfield. So let's thank our, our guests one, one more time.